Well, God bless you, House of Praise family. Pastor Steve here again for another time in the Word of God. We're now in John, the 21st chapter today. And boy, are we excited about what God has revealed to us through the book of John and uh, all the different incredible events that were covered and what Jesus had to deal with. And of course, the end of his life leading to crucifixion. And then of course, the glorious moments of the resurrection and all of the events that surrounded that. So we're, we're excited about this. And of course, the 21st chapter has some really important things to say to us. Let's pray. Lord, in Jesus' name, I pray that you will open up our minds and our hearts so that we can indeed hear you, O God, and hear the voice of the Holy Spirit as we read John 21. And uh, Lord, we are prepared, Father, for moving into this new season that you are bringing us into, O God. And we believe with all of our heart that you're going to be so revealing to us, so Uh, breaking down every detailed step, O God, as we put our trust in you. Lord, we are trusting you, Father. The Word of God clearly tells us to acknowledge the Lord in all of our ways and that you would direct our path, each step of our path. So, Lord, we know that you're going to do that, and we're trusting you, and we're excited about what you're saying to us today. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's go now to John 21, and uh, we'll start reading at the first verse. This is a very unusual chapter with some very important messages to all of us. Let's start reading at verse 1. Later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. And boy, that was one of his favorite spots, wasn't it? Did a lot of ministry around Galilee. We've been there. We've been to Galilee. We've been in many areas and the different uh, cities and towns surrounding the Sea of Galilee. And boy, it it was a a beautiful place. And uh, boy, we can understand why Jesus loved to be there. It was beautiful. And uh, so Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. Verse number uh, two. This is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there, and it makes a list here. Simon Peter, Thomas, who was also nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, that was uh, James and John, and two other disciples. Verse number three, Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. And they answered and said, we'll come too. It says they all say it. So I guess they had a boat big enough that they could all get in and, and go out there and do some fishing. Now, many of these guys had done fishing for a living. They knew what they were doing. And, and they got to remember now, they, they, they have already been exposed to Jesus in his resurrected state. And they probably didn't fully understand that he was only going to be with them a short time and that he would be ascended to the Father, even though he had told them that many, many times, but they probably still hadn't grasped that. So you got to keep that in mind. So Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. And we'll come too, they all said. So they all went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. Imagine, boy, they've been there before, haven't they, in that experience. Verse number four, at dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. He called out, fellows, have you caught any fish? And they said, no. Then he said, throw out your net on the right hand side of the boat and you'll get some. Amen. I just believe that there is such an incredible spiritual message here. So they did, and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. You know, one of the things that Jesus made very clear to Simon, who we now call Simon Peter, right at the very beginning when he first met Peter, when Andrew first introduced uh, Peter uh, to, to Jesus, He said, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. 
And I don't think he understood that at that time at all. And, uh, and he was probably even struggling still because he, even in, in this situation, after the crucifixion, after the incredible miracle of the resurrection, here they are still fishing. He probably was thinking he needed to provide for his family. Remember, Peter was married and he had to take care of his wife. So he was going to make some money. And, and that's all good. He had good intentions. Amen. So they did and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. Now, verse number seven. Then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, that's John now. Keep in mind, whenever you see the disciple that Jesus loved, that's referring to John, uh, St. John. It's the Lord, he said. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he had stripped for work, and jumped into the water and headed for the shore. And the other stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to the shore, for they were only about a hundred yards from shore. And when they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over a charcoal fire, and some bread. <laughs> Gotta remember, Jesus had a glorified body, but it appears now that he was eating with his disciples, his friends, his apostles. So I guess this is the way I've explained it, and, and I don't, I'm not an authority on glorified bodies. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it appears to be that you can eat even in, in a glorified body. I believe that you don't have to eat, but you can eat. Same way maybe with sleeping, that you don't have to sleep, but you can sleep. And uh, so uh, I, I'm not an authority on glorified bodies. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is what I can see in Scripture. It appears that Jesus, even in his glorified body, could eat because he had prepared some breakfast. Now, I want to make some comments here. He actually hollered out and said, Fellows, have you caught any fish? And he said, No, nothing all night. He said, Well, throw your net now on the right side of the boat. Now, this was an a very specific instruction from our Lord that they would throw the net on the right side of the boat. And when that happened, a supernatural event took place that there were 153 large fish that were caught immediately, which was something supernatural. Remember, they had been out there all night, caught nothing. And, and here it was, this miracle of the fish, which they had experienced before, now they're experiencing it again. I believe with all my heart what Jesus was saying, he was saying something very, very clear, that I have called you to be fishers of men. This was an illustrated sermon, is what it was that God is going to provide the anointing, the strength, the wisdom, and all that we need. And I believe that applies to me. That applies to you. That applies to us even today, that as we are obedient to him, just be obedient to him, and he will cause the fish to come into the net. That's, that's talking about our ministries, guys. That's talking about what God wants to use you for even today. Maybe you'll pull into a Wawa to get gas, and maybe you can strike up a conversation with somebody. I know I did yesterday. It was wonderful. And then when you go maybe to the Aldi's or to the ShopRite or wherever you're going doing your daily things, you will have opportunities. God will place people in your path. You will have an opportunity to make a contact. I believe that's what was represented by throwing the net on the right side of the boat, taking in a very specific instruction from Christ and yielding a benefit. Amen. Let's go to verse number 10. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went abroad and uh, aboard the boat, rather, and, and dragged the net to the shore. There were 153 large fish and yet the net still hadn't broken. <laughs> I just love this. You know, when Jesus does things, I'm telling you, he has, he has everything in order. He, he's a God of order. He, he knows exactly the end from the beginning. He's the Alpha and Omega. He is, he is the omniscient God. He knows exactly what's going on in your life. 
And so here it was, 153 fish. I believe that was representation of a yield of their ministry. Amen. Verse number 12. Now come and let's have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? (laughs) They knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. Amen. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning. Lord, we just want to be obedient to you. We want to follow your instructions. We know that you will feed us. You will provide for us, oh God. This was another illustrated sermon of the divine provision of the Lord. The Lord will provide. Where God guides, he will provide. I had one of the uh, one of uh, an elder of the ministry that we're ordained under uh, say that to me just recently, uh, because the Lord had continued to provide for our church, even though we've had some attendance issues, as a lot of churches have. And uh, he said, the fact that God is still providing, that God has given you enough to do everything that you're being called to do, that's a sure sign that you're following him and you're in the center of his will. Keep doing what you're doing. That was a big encouragement to us. Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. It says in verse 13, verse 14, this was the third time that Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. So once again, these appearances, these were all confirmations of this incredible event of him being raised from the dead. Amen. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now verse 15. And after breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know that I love you. And then Jesus said, then feed my lambs. Verse number 16. Then Jesus repeated the same question. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Peter said, you know that I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. Now verse 17. And a third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Then Jesus said, then feed my sheep. What was Jesus saying to Simon Peter? He, I think he was questioning the fact, you know, that he loved to fish and, 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 and not that he couldn't fish and still be in the ministry, of course. Of course he could. But what Jesus was making a very, very strong point that if you love me more than you love even to fish, as wonderful and fun that is, as that is, you know, then you will feed my lambs. Now, what Jesus was talking about, he described himself in the book of John as the great shepherd, amen, the great shepherd of the sheep. So he was talking about, obviously, souls. He was talking about people. He was talking about brothers and sisters and families. He was talking about those who rejected Jesus that needed to find him. That's what Jesus meant when he said, feed my sheep. Amen. Verse number 18, I tell you the truth. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked, and you dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death that he would glorify God. Then Jesus told him, follow me. What he was saying to Peter there, this is a very important thing to understand, that sometimes, you know, we we forget that we are under the instruction of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And it says here, when you are old, in other words, when you are more mature, okay, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you. In other words, the Holy Spirit has instruction for each and every one of us. And maybe things will happen that we don't understand, or maybe we don't even want to do or want to go somewhere. And then Jesus said to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. See, we have to die to ourselves And then, yes, he was also telling Peter also what would happen in the future, that there would be complicated things that he would have to deal with. 
And then yes, there would be a lot of things that would happen that even would lead to a martyr's death. Jesus was hinting to that as well. Now, verse number uh, number 20. Peter turned around and saw behind them the disciple that Jesus loved. Boy, here it was again. Peter, I don't know, maybe felt a little jealousy. Maybe he felt a little bit concerned. He he, he wasn't sure exactly what was happening between Jesus and John. And the one who had leaned over to Jesus during the supper and asked, Lord, who will betray you? So he's referring to John here, because that's what John did. John was sitting next to Jesus at the Last Supper, and he did lean over and said, who will betray you? Then Peter asked Jesus, what about him, Lord? What's going to happen to him? What's your relationship with him? Jesus replied, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? As for you, you just follow me. So the rumors spread among the community of believers that this disciple wouldn't die. But that isn't what Jesus said at all. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? So obviously that was a misunderstanding. Jesus didn't say he wouldn't die. He would say, you know, if I want him to stay alive until I come again. He was referring to the revelation, I believe, on the Isle of Patmos, when Jesus Christ would be revealed to John, and he would pen the incredible book that we have today called the Book of Revelations. And there was an incredible encounter that John had <coughs> excuse me, with, with an angel and, and with Jesus himself. And it, it was, I mean, as we read through the Book of Revelations, it is beyond human words. I mean, it's so phenomenal what was revealed to John. It was the revelation of Jesus Christ is what it was. Amen. It wasn't a revelation of John. It was a revelation of Jesus Christ in his resurrected, glorified state. And as what would happen in the end times. Very, very important part of John's life. Now, this disciple... It says in at verse 24, this disciple is the one who testifies to these events. Now, it's referring to John. John's referring to himself here, okay, because he's writing this and has recorded them here. And we know that his account of these things is accurate. Jesus also did many other things. And if they were all written down, I suppose the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. John made that very clear that if everything was recorded that Jesus did, it would be like an impossible task to to record everything, certainly especially at that time with the means that they had of recording. And uh, I mean, there were times when uh, the scriptures clearly say that, you know, he, he went into a town and he healed them all. I mean, that may have been like hundreds, maybe thousands of people. We We know that there was... I have no doubt, at least hundreds, maybe even thousands of healings, miracles, things that Jesus did, things that he taught that were not recorded. And that's what John is referring to there, that if we tried to record everything, it would have been an impossible task. And uh, so it's an interesting comment. I, I believe that God has given us enough. And enough has been recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and also the book of Acts, and then also all the other writings of the Apostle Paul and Peter and and all these wonderful writings we have in the New Testament. So we just thank God for that and all that we have and all that has been recorded and the blessing that we have. Lord, in the name of Jesus, bless our hearts and our minds now with what we have read in the book of John. We have now completed the 21st chapter. And Lord, I I thank you for John. I thank you for his heart. I thank you for his in-depth understanding of who Jesus Christ was, the incarnate divine logos, amen, And, and the incarnate God, amen, where he was truly, fully, truly God, and also fully and truly a man at the same time. Lord, we thank you for this revelation. And Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that the Holy Spirit will now encourage us, strengthen us, build us up, speak to us, O God, as we continue to study your word. And Lord, may we be obedient to everything 
that God has told us to do. Lord, may we throw the net out on the right side of the boat, so to speak. And we know that you've got a great harvest waiting for us all as we continue to keep our eyes on you and be obedient to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, I trust that's been a blessing to you today and uh, have a wonderful day. And uh, we're going to be studying the book of Mark next. So it's going to be a wonderful time together. We're going to continue to grow in our relationship with him. We're going to get closer and closer. We're going to have a better understanding. We're going to be used of God in, in powerful ways, every one of us, as we keep our eyes fixed upon him. God bless you and have a wonderful, wonderful day.